If you don't know me, uh, my name is Ben Voss, and I'm the director of youth ministry at our Orange City campus. Uh, and I'm just so excited about the text this morning, but also our whole series, which we've called Intended for Good. And we're looking at the story of Joseph in this series. And if you're not familiar with that story, it's a long one. And it's got a lot of characters, and it's got some mystery and some intrigue mixed into it. It's got plenty of sinfulness and mistakes and messy, dysfunctional family dynamics. It sounds, sounds like a great story, doesn't it? Well, if you're familiar with it or not, it really is a good story. And the lessons that we can learn from this story, I think, are foundational to what it means for us to have faith in God. I submit to you today that in order for us to better understand what God is up to in our own lives and in, in the world around us, it's going to require us to change. If you want to know how God works, you have to change. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't love you or that God doesn't accept you exactly the way you are, even in your sinfulness and in your brokenness and your dysfunction, but I am saying that God has a plan for who you are becoming. We'll see that in the life of Joseph. We'll see that in the life of his entire family, and we'll see that in the systems and the cultures that we meet in Genesis 37. Throughout the Bible, God meets people where they are, habits and hang-ups and all of that, and then he introduces them to a new way of being, a new way of seeing things, and all of that requires change. God's ways so many times can seem unorthodox or mysterious or even confusing from our perspective, and it's not because God's trying to hide something from us. It's because he wants us to try a new way of seeing things. He wants us to try a new way of, of living. And the story of Joseph gives us a great example of what I mean. But before we get to that story, I'd like to share a story about my family. So there I was with the family in the van, my wife and our three children, on, a way, on our way to a wonderful vacation that Lisa and I had planned. We were headed to Phoenix, Arizona for Christmas. We couldn't wait to get there to see Grandma and Grandpa. Lisa and I were excited to escape the cold Northwest Iowa weather for a week, and our kids were, were so excited to see their cousins, to sleep in Grandma and Grandpa's camper. We, we were just excited. This was gonna be a great vacation. And as the navigatorial leader, the navigational leader of this trip, I had departure times, I had food and gas stops, I had hotel reservations, I had arrival times perfectly planned out. Now some of you teenagers who are listening to this and you've been on a mission trip with me, you know that when Ben Voss makes a schedule, Ben Voss sticks to the schedule. So there we were, as a family, traveling south by southwest to the great Sonoran Desert. This is my home. I love, I love trips like this. Going on vacation is so much fun. It's a, it's a chance to get out on the open road. It's a chance to see some beautiful country, maybe even to meet some fellow travelers. It's a chance to have quality windshield time with people that I love, right? Whether, whether I'm on a mission trip with teenagers or I'm, I'm in the van with my own family, I love trips like this. We try to take a trip like this every year. Maybe it's a, a camping vacation to Colorado or to the Black Hills, or maybe it's going down to Phoenix to see my family. It's a beautiful thing to make time for a vacation. And usually, at some point in time on a trip like this, my children can lose sight of the weeks of planning and preparation that their parents have put into a trip like this. My kids can become distracted. My kids can get really bored. My kids can get super annoying with all of their questions and their tiny little bladders and their constant need of our attention. And usually, somewhere along the way, I hear something like this from the back of the van. Dad. 
Dad, I just saw a McDonald's. I saw it. There was a sign on the road, Dad. I saw the arches for McDonald's. Dad, can we please, Dad, come on. We've been really good, Dad. You haven't had to yell at us for like, I don't know, like 10 minutes, Dad. We've been really good. We've listened to what you've said. Can we just, Dad, I would love to get some ice cream at McDonald's. Can we just please pull over? Just please, Dad, can you please pull over? I want to go to McDonald's. Weaker people might cave in a situation like this. It's a good thing, church. It's a good thing. I'm not a weaker person. Even my wife, even my wife, who is so strong in so many areas of her life, even my wife can begin to cave, can begin to give in in a situation like this. She'll, she'll look at me with this subtle glance as if to say, honey, you don't have to be in such a hurry. Let them get some ice cream. We're, we're on vacation. This detour isn't going to mess up our plans. I'm here to tell you this morning, church, this little detour most definitely will mess up our plans. This is an unplanned stop. This is an extravagant waste of time. This is moving away from plan A, and I don't like it. It is no good at all. We have a schedule. It's a schedule that I set, and it's a schedule that will work perfectly if no one and nothing alters it. We must press on. So, in my calm and collected fatherly voice, I lovingly look into the rearview mirror of these three human beings that I love so much, and I announce that we will not be stopping at McDonald's. And I tell them instead that they should return to quietly playing with their Mr. Potato Heads, and if they're really that hungry, they can probably find some snacks that mommy packed for them in the van. I don't like change. I never have. Now, I, I think as I get a little older, I'm getting a bit better at accepting it, at rolling with it. But if I'm being honest with you this morning, change creates in me all kinds of anxiety and emotions that I would rather not deal with. The story of Joseph is a story of change. God gives him a couple of dreams, and these dreams are the beginning of the work of God to change everything. By the end of the story, which we'll get to in four weeks, it's 13 chapters away, by the end of the story, we're going to see a change in the heart and the character and the nature of Joseph himself. We will also see a change in how God distributes power among his people and throughout the world in general. And hopefully, hopefully, by the end of today, the example we have in the story of Joseph will be enough to convince us that if we're going to see and participate in the will of God, there's a change that's also required in us. So, uh, open your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open it to the very first book in the Bible. It's Genesis. It's right after the table of contents. We're going to read 25 verses in chapter 37 of the book of Genesis, starting in verse 12. Uh, and because it is 25 verses, I'd like to invite my summer youth intern, Ben DeBoer, up. And he's going to help me read this passage. So it's Genesis 37, starting in verse 12, and we'll finish that chapter. Hear now the words of the Lord. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the field, the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They, that's Joseph's brothers, they saw him from afar. 
And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him. And we'll see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben, that's the firstborn, when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. Throw him into the pit here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to the brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. That, that might be the funniest part in this whole story. They, they do this to Joseph and, oh, it's lunchtime. What what mom pack? Let's break out the Lunchables. Let's go. They sat down to eat. Verse 25. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum and balm and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, well, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. For he's our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then the Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit, and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, the boy is gone and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, this we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, no, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh the captain of the guard. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ben, for helping us this morning. All right, Genesis 37 is the first time in Joseph's story that we get a hint of the change that will take place in Joseph's heart. See, Joseph lived in between the dream, which is in chapter 37, and the dream's fulfillment, which is in chapters 48 through 50. The, the time in between those chapters is a little bit more than 20 years. Now, perhaps for us this morning, this story is a call to let the dream be at work. If you feel like you've received something from, something from the Lord or God has given you a vision or a dream, that even, even if the outcome remains several years away or maybe in this in-between time when the results of what you think God is telling you are less than clear, maybe this is the time when God will do some of his best work in your heart. It took Joseph 20 years to turn into the person that God needed him to be in order to fill a vital role, not just in his own family, but also in the empire that was Egypt. Like us, Joseph probably didn't see fully what God was up to until the very end. But he didn't need to see fully in order to have the dream. He didn't need to see fully in order to play his part in the will of God. He didn't need to see fully in order for his heart and his character to begin to change. We all want to see and to know and be in control, don't we? At least, at least I know I do. 
Yet in the story of Joseph, he is none of these things. He can't see, he can't know, he's not in control. His brothers grab him, they probably rough him up a little bit, and then they cast him into this dry well. It's dark in there. It's way deep down. There's no water down there. He has no way of getting himself out. For all he knows, this well will become his grave. Then he's picked up out of the well miraculously, and and he's sold as a slave to some strangers who are headed to a foreign country called Egypt. At this point in the story, Joseph can't see Joseph can't know what's going on. He certainly isn't in control, but he's beginning to change. Did you notice that from the moment Joseph finds his brothers to the moment he's sold as a slave, Joseph says nothing. In the text that we read this morning, Joseph talks two times. The first time is when he answers his dad. His dad says, hey, I need you to go check on the brothers and on the sheep. Can you go for me? And Joseph says, yep, here I am. I'm ready, dad. And then he gets to Shechem where his brothers were supposed to be and he meets a stranger and the stranger says, what are you doing here? And Joseph says, I'm trying to find my brothers and the sheep. Can you tell me where they went? And so the guy tells him and he goes to Dothan and that's the last time Joseph talks. The rest of this text, the rest of this narrative in chapter 37, Joseph is little more than a quiet observer. We're not told what Joseph is thinking. We're not told what he's feeling. We don't know if things are going to get better for him. I wonder if the author of this story is inviting us to witness the beginning of a change in Joseph. I think this is a delicate portrayal of a young man who's learning the lessons of life. As I read through this, I can't help but think of uh, a passage out of Romans chapter 8. When I think about the person of Joseph, it reminds me of Paul's words that he writes in Romans 8, starting in verse 28. It says this, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what's happening to Joseph. Even though Jesus isn't on earth yet, Jesus doesn't come on the scene for hundreds of years yet, Joseph is being conformed to the image of Jesus. He's becoming more like Christ. In order that, Paul says, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, those whom he predestined, he also called, those whom he called, he also justified, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, Paul is obviously talking about Jesus in that passage, but I think in Joseph, we see a kind of Jesus, a type of Jesus. He is predestined by God to rule. He will be the firstborn among many brethren. Even though biologically he's 11th in line, God takes him and puts him in the first spot. He will be the first among all of his brothers. He's finally glorified, and everything in the story works towards Joseph's destiny. This story is about him and his life and how he changes from a cocky, arrogant, loudmouth young man to somebody who will eventually become second in command in the most powerful empire in the known world. This story is about Joseph, just just like the whole Bible, the big picture narrative story that God tells us, just like the whole whole Bible is really about Jesus and how he changes from perfection and glory in heaven and he comes down and is humbled and he puts skin on and he lives with us as human, sinful, selfish human beings for 33 years and then he's finally glorified. Everything in the Bible points to Jesus. It's really a story of Jesus. This story is about Joseph. There's just a hint of it here. 
but we're beginning to see Joseph change. Like Jesus, he was silent before his enemies. Like Jesus, he was humbled. He was lied about. He was betrayed. He was sold for money, right? For, for 20 pieces of, sh of silver, for 20 shekels, Joseph is sold. In the New Testament, for 10 pieces more, Jesus is betrayed. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Can you see the connections between Joseph and Jesus? The heart of Joseph needs to change. And it starts when he's stripped of his robe, when he's tossed into a pit, and then when he's sold as a slave. All of this brings us to the next kind of change we see, which is a change in power. Now let's go back to Joseph's family for just a minute. If, if you think your family is messed up, just... Just hang on tight, right? Take heart. If you think you have problems, just wait. The family we're studying in Genesis 37 is like certified crazy, okay? Like nut house. Like put them in the institution, right? These guys are just, there's dysfunction, all right? This family, Father Jacob, shows favoritism to one son, which leads all the other brothers to hate this son. And this conflict, this hatred exists, remains a part of the story for 20-some years. Even after Father Jacob dies, the brothers are still trying to deceive each other, trying to figure out how to leverage their position for more power and more authority. There's all kinds of hatred and, and betrayal in this family. The family does not like Joseph, and they really don't like Joseph's dreams. For them, the dreams disturb the peace. For them, the dreams seem more like a curse. For them, they would manage better without the dreams because the dreams disrupt the normal, proper ordering. That's where we see the beginning of change in the larger family system and in the entire region at that time in human history. These dreams and this dreamer, as he is called, messes things up. These dreams happen to a powerless boy from a no-name family, and they give that boy a new way of imagining the future. This threatens the brothers, and this new way of seeing the future, this new way that power will be distributed and authority will be given, it eventually threatens the established powers as well. To be sure, the dreams Joseph have, has are about power. Again, I can't help but think of Jesus as I read this story. Like Joseph's brothers, Jesus' brothers were bothered by him. Remember, he was, he was preaching and teaching and healing people, and J Jesus' brothers came up to him and said, hey, can you, can you just come back home? Like, that's enough. Stop, stop what, you're what you're doing. You're embarrassing us. Like, just, just come home. Can you just come and be a carpenter like us and like our father? Jesus' brothers were bothered by him. They would have rather he just kept quiet and got along. Joseph's story points us to the one who speaks about the first being last and the last being first. This story points us to the one who causes power inversions like we're seeing in this story. This is how God works and it requires change. Now, the final kind of change that, that we see, or at least I can see in Genesis 37, I, I can see it in myself, and, and maybe you're going to be there too in just a moment. It, it's a change in us. I'm Reuben. In this story, I'm Reuben. I'm a brother who feels threatened by Joseph. I'm a brother who is jealous for the love and the attention of my father. I'm a brother who feels the weight of responsibility and authority, right? Like, I, I, I don't want to kill him. I know we probably shouldn't kill him. But I wouldn't mind if Joseph went away for a while, if we would just be done with him and his dreams, right? I'm a brother who wishes Joseph would just hush up and get along. I want things to stay the same, I'm the firstborn. 
I have the birthright. When dad dies, I get the majority of the inheritance. My other 11 brothers can fight over whatever little percentage they get. I get most of it. I'm in charge, and I like it that way. I'm Reuben. This dream that my brother has is a threat. It's uncomfortable. It causes the system around me to change, and I don't like that. I want to get in my car and drive from A to B in exactly the way I planned. But that's not how God chooses to work. Whether I like it or not, whether I can control it or not, whether I can even see what God is up to or not, God is at work. And he's working his plan out according to his good will and for my benefit. That's what the story of Joseph teaches us. Joseph's heart and Joseph's character needed to change. The way God distributed power was about to change. And if we're going to see and participate in what God is doing in the world, I think we need to keep changing too. So who are you in this story? Can you find yourself in one of the characters? Are you like me? Are, are you one of the brothers? You're quite content with the status quo. You would like things to stay just the way they are. Maybe you connect with Father Jacob, who thinks he loses his son and he's unwilling to be comforted. Jacob is a flawed father figure. Definitely, right? He, he's got dysfunction a mile long, right? But I think here, maybe Jacob gets it right. I think Jacob mourns because he loses his son, and, and, and this is going to change everything. Even, even if it's good change, right? Even if Jacob, who kind of knew the nature of the dreams and, and believed that Joseph, even though he was 11th, that Joseph was going to be exalted, that, that Joseph is the one that God chose, even if it's good change, even if we know this is for our benefit, even if we know this is God's will, good change still brings loss. Jacob loses his son and he mourns. The brothers don't mourn. The sisters don't mourn. They try to comfort their dad, and when that doesn't work, they just, they just move on with their lives. We've lost quite a bit in the last few months, haven't we? Some of us maybe more than others. How many of us, like Jacob, have given time to the process of grief? How many of us have mourned because we've lost something? How many of us, maybe like the siblings instead, have, have tried to rush this process, have hoped that things would get back to normal as fast as possible, right? I, I know that's where I've been for so, so much of the last three months. Like, let's just go back to normal. Let's just have it the way it was. Church, our whole world has faced a significant amount of change. And change means loss. Maybe today you're like Jacob. Jacob. You're allowing yourself to mourn what we've lost. Or maybe today you connect with, you identify with Joseph. Maybe you've been in a position of, of favoritism, a, a position of, uh, that, that you've maybe even been spoiled or privileged or uh, you, you've had a, a, a touch of arrogance. You're a little bit smug. But then some things happened over, over the course of time. There were circumstances out of your control. You couldn't, you couldn't uh, change what was about to happen. It happened to you anyway. Like Joseph, he was humbled. He was sold as a slave. And, and you're left wondering what good could possibly come of this situation. Now, maybe God will leave you just the way you are. Maybe change isn't required in your situation. You've already arrived. You're patient. You're kind. You're gentle. You never blow up at your kids anymore. You never get in fights with your spouse. You, all your relationships are going well. Maybe you've done the hard work of helping your family and your systems to become healthy. Maybe you don't need to change. But the witness of Scripture, and certainly, certainly the example of Joseph and his family, tells me that we all 
need to change. Indeed, God loves us and he meets us just the way we are. No change required. His love for us doesn't inflate, it doesn't deflate, it doesn't go away. It's 100% for us all the time, no matter our choices, no matter our circumstances. Nothing changes God's love and nothing can separate us from God's love to steal Paul's words again from Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8. But if you read the story of Joseph and if you take into consideration the whole of scripture, I think you might begin to realize that God isn't interested in leaving you just the way you are. Even if you are near perfect, maybe there are some of us like that, even if you're near perfect, God wants to work on you some more. God wants you to change and become more like his son Jesus. Remember, this is about how we are conformed into his image, how every day we are molded and shaped and God chips things away from us that are not of him and he shapes us and fashions us more and more every day into the likeness of Christ. We're becoming like Jesus. Every day we become a little bit more like him than we were the day before. That's what this is about. Joseph was conformed into the image of Jesus. We are conformed into the image of Jesus. And if you're like me, that means change. We have to change. So, the next time you find yourself sitting in a van with a bunch of young people, maybe it's some teenagers on a trip, maybe it's your own biological children, I want to encourage you to throw your plans out the window and pull over. You never know how God might want to do a work in you while you're paying for their ice cream. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we sing about changing our hearts. That you would send the Holy Spirit to us so that we might be remade, recreated in your image. And God, I think it's easy to sing about things like that. It's not so easy when it's time to actually change. Just like Joseph, God, I'm sure some of us are in situations where we wonder, what is going on? There's no way, there's no way God can redeem this or fix this or save me from this person or from this situation. Like Joseph, I'm sure we can't see clearly what it is that you're doing. But God, help us to know that it's in these in-between times, it's in these moments where you are doing some of your best work. You so badly want to show us your will and your plan, but you're not going to do it all at once. You do it slowly, one step at a time. You continue to reveal your heart and your character and your nature and your good plans and purposes. And God, I pray that in this time where we are changing, being conformed into the image of your son, God, would you just help us to trust you? Help us to know that you do have our best interests at heart, that you do know exactly what you're doing and how you're going to do it. And even if we can't see it, God, help us to trust you. Help us to be silent, to listen, to take the time to mourn and to grieve what we're losing, to acknowledge change for what it is. Change is so hard. God, help us to change nonetheless. All for your honor, all for your glory, all to participate in what you are doing to redeem your creation. God, thank you for the work that you're doing. God, help us to be willing partners. Help us to submit ourselves to who you want us to become. We pray in Jesus' name and all who agreed said, amen.